We call this meeting to order at the Brownsville Independent School District Board of Trustees Facility Committee meeting, March 23rd, 2021, 5.30 p.m. here at the BISD Administration Building Boardroom at 1900 East Price Road, Brownsville, Texas, 78521. Members of the committee are Ms. Brown. She does regret, uh, she is the uh, committee chair and she does regret not being able to chair the meeting today due to family illness. So we send her our regards. Um, if we can stand up for the pledge and then we'll keep going. Ms. Peña. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now the Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. Pledge allegiance to the Texas one state. Under God, one and Thank you. We do want to recognize my fellow colleagues that are here, Ms. Board President and Mr. Garcia, and also committee member. Welcome. Ms. Peña, welcome. Ms. Daniela Lopez Valdez, welcome. Dr. Gutierrez, and Ms. Jessica Gonzalez, and Ms. Denise Garza. Thank you for being here. The committee goal is to provide and maintain adequate facilities in order to support ongoing academic pros, uh, progress. And now I'll hand it over to Dr. Gutierrez. Thank you, Dr. Tipton and, and board members and everyone here present to uh, this facility committee uh, meeting. Um, I will ask that uh, we can go out of order, Madam Chair, uh, on yes. the agenda so that uh, we can cover item F first since we have some uh, elected officials from, or elected official, Mr. Tony Seguirre from Cameron County here for this item. And if we can just move it up on the agenda to be the first item and cover that. And so I'll turn it over to Dr. Cantu just to give us a, a summary and or overview of this item that uh, will be coming up at the next board meeting on April the 6th. Go ahead, Dr. Cantu. Thank you, Dr. Gutierrez. Madam Chair um, and board members, thank you for the opportunity to come before you again this afternoon for the Facilities Committee meeting. Uh, Dr. Gutierrez mentioned we're going, we're going to jump. We have an agenda here. We're going to jump to item G, which is a transfer of property to Cameron County Tax Office. And I believe it is slide number 32. I'm going to have some help here. We're jumping over to slide number 34. Okay, so this item has to do it's with 36, uh, 36. Page 36. Thank you, Dr. Gutierrez. I want to make sure everyone is there already on page 36. This is a transfer of property to Cameron County Tax Office. And so I provided a, a brief summary, for especially for our new board members. There was an original request back in June of 2020. And the request was um, for real estate, the request to donate some real estate that is adjacent to Cromack Elementary. Uh, this real estate is actually a retention pond. And so the retention pond is adjacent and this is the area that is being requested. The response in June of 2020 was that administration was not ready to recommend any transfer of property uh, because of the potential flooding that it would be, uh, that could impact BISD property. And uh, this could be in the building itself or in the parking lot. So this request has been resubmitted January of 2021. And so right now we do have uh, an MOU that was provided. I did see it on my desk that was provided. Um, and at this time, I, uh, before I go and ask the attorneys for their suggestions, one of the things that I do want to emphasize is that track of land. If you'll notice there in bold letters, it says uh, it is a 0.2825 acre tract of Brownsville. It is a very small piece of land. And if here we have a visual of that land. The square that you see is a... Uh, Actually, uh, property belongs to the county already, or the city, I should say. And then the triangle that you see there is the request for that donation. However, the 
what I had here as a next step was to re have an MOU that included a mitigation, a flood mitigation plan before we made a recommendation. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to or ask the, our attorneys if they've had an opportunity to review it and if it satisfies the requirement that we requested. Mr. Salinas. Thank you, Mr. Salinas. You, you worked on this? The, um, as Dr. Cantu, good afternoon, everyone. As Dr. Cantu said, um, the county owns a portion of that land. It was donated by the city. They're going to construct a, I guess, an ancil anc ancillary tax assessor's office. They want the additional 0.285 acres that Dr. Cantu showed. Uh, it's currently used by the district as a retention pond for runoff from the parking lot at Cromac. They have uh, assured us, both in their original correspondence and in the MOU, that they will keep it as a uh, detention retention pond. Uh, and they've also indicated that they will work with the district. Their architects and our engineers will work with the district to ensure that we address, they address any concerns we have. I'd like, they did prepare the local, uh, interlocal agreement. I'd like to tighten it up to include that language that they will submit the plans and work with the district prior to any construction, but, um, Obviously, you know, it's up to the board what they want to do with this property, but uh, um, it's, it is a detention pond. It's going to remain a detention pond. It will assist us, uh, assist us south, southmost area in building the tax assessor's office for those people that don't have uh, the opportunity to go downtown and whatever the board thinks. Ms. Peña? Yes, so it's a retention pond, right? That yes, ma'am. For okay, runoff, it's, yeah, you said it's detention, dry so it's for 90% of the time. To make sure that there's no flooding and that the parking lot is free and clear of, of overflow of water. Am I correct? Correct. Our, our obviously, our concerns is that they don't configure it to where uh, the runoff is from the property and then it's going to overflow into our property. That's why I want to tighten this agreement up to make sure that anything that they do is run through our architectural architect and before uh, the plans are finalized. And we'll tighten up this local agreement if that's what the board wants. And, and I appreciate that because we have to, um, I'm all for assisting the county and the city to move forward, but in this process that the city, I mean, the district is not affected in a negative way anytime in the future, like 20 years from now, I still want that thing to be working properly. Sorry. Exactly. Because I just want to make sure we take care of our schools. Mr. And I'm sure that will happen. Mr. Salinas, I do have a question. I just want to make sure that what you just mentioned, I think item number four covers it, but I just want to confirm. It says the county agrees to keep the property's use as a retention pond and to submit to the district the architectural and engineering plans for its review to ensure that any concerns by the district are addressed. It, it, yes, it, okay. it does. I just want to make sure they, do, they don't go ahead and build and then show us these are the plans after we build. Make sure that they... Show us the plans before they do any construction and that we, that we sign off on the plans before they do I any construction. Yeah. I think uh, all our conversations uh, with Mr. Izaguirre uh, have been, you know, that that's our concern and they are very uh, aware, uh, they're, they are aware of this and they're going to work with us in terms of making sure that it meets our needs and it meets their needs. Uh, this... Uh, branch or this satellite office they're going to have there is to serve the southmost area so it will be proximity to that area that uh, we have a lot of our residents and a lot of our taxpayers in that area and it would serve the entire community of the southmost area uh, that office will be there for their services without having to come all the way across Bronzeville too and they're going to have these offices uh, available in their area so now so it's a, it's the, a good service. The original service. correspondence indicates that they will uh, work with us before they finalize the plans. I just want to make sure that uh, uh, that verbiage is included in the MOU. Yes, M Mr. Salazar. If I may, Madam Chair, uh, board members, uh, county officials. My only concern, and this has been my concern from the beginning, has been that the engineering that's done and the architect, because we do want to keep it a, as a flood area, and I've had this conversation with, with Mr. our architect also, 
that it's done before we donate the property. And the reason we want to do it before is because we don't want them to start construction or start everything and then guess what, BISD gets flooded out. We need, and I think that's been our plan from the beginning, that before we donate the property, that they give us engineering plans and architectural plans that's going to guarantee that we're not going to uh, over exceed our, our retention pond. That's number one. Or we could deed it over to them with, the, with, the, uh, with a uh, reversion clause in there that says if it doesn't meet our needs and we don't approve it then the property would come back to BISD. I want to make sure that we don't donate it and then it's too late. Once you give a gift it's gone. You can't go back. So my thing is that we guarantee that it, that the engineering and the architecture is done and BISD approves it prior to the donation, prior to construction. That way I'm 100 percent. I think we need to cooperate with the county. But the other way if we let we donate it to them and then they do it and it doesn't fit guess what we're it's too late we've already given it away that's my only concern and I can work with Mr. Salinas uh, and the county to make sure that that language is in there either we get it prior to and we approve it or we have a reversion clause that the property would revert back to us but I would I would prefer to have it prior to and if I may Miss Pena and I, I kind of oh. agree as far as the construction and having the building I want to make sure that the retention pond, and I'm sure Mr. Isaguirre would also take care of that, that the retention pond is built and not build the building and then find out, well, we don't have enough room to put the type of retention pond that we really needed. So I want the retention pond, with all due respect, to be that priority because it's going to benefit not only our school district, but the building that they put in place there. So I agree with that, and I'm sure that the county will make sure they look at that because we got to take care of both spaces, the county building and the yes. school property. Thank we, you, Ms. Peña. We Mr. Had discussion, Mr. Salazar, we had that discussion that we wanted to see uh, a design plan of the how the water was going to drain away from Cromac. But the county is saying, look, we, we want to proceed. We want to be able to meet the needs of the district and what the district is requiring us to do. And Mr. Zaguirre, by any, ch by any you know, if you want to present, by, by all means, uh, they... But they said, we don't want to go through an expense and having to go through a design plan and then the district doesn't transfer the land. But they do know that that is our number one priority in the transfer of this property is to make sure that the flooding and the, the way the, the water is going to flow away from the parking lot from Cromac is going to be there as part of the design plan of, the, of that area when they start building their office. And he's very aware of that. He's here, he's present, and he's hearing us that that is our number one priority is that as this, as this property transfers, just take care of the, the way the, the waters are going to flow away from the parking lot from Cromac. Well, it, it, I think the term is a flood mitigation plan. Mm -hmm. we, we need a, that flood mitigation plan before they start construction. But once they start construction, it's too late. So. Thank well, you, we Mr. can put that in the language. Okay. Yes, and I think that they do agree to keep the property's use as a retention pond. Yes. But Mr. Um, Dr. Isagiri, would you like to add something or your mm -hmm. up there? Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President and Vice President and members of the board. This, this project uh, came about in uh, 2019 when uh, PV knocked down the uh, water tower there on South Notes and Lima Street. And uh, when I saw that tower being torn down uh, and, and uh, I was visiting my office there in the South Notes, we have a small office, very small office there at the, at the South Notes uh, Police Department. And of course, uh, we've been there for many years. And of course, it's a one person office and, and, and it doesn't take care of the issues of that area. Because we're talking about 35, 40,000 people in that area. So the first thing I, I did was contact the Brownsville, uh, Brownsville PUV to see if they could transfer the property. Then uh, we found out through the title research, we hired uh, Valley Abstract to do the title research, well, we found out PUV doesn't own the property. It belongs to Brownsville, the city of Brownsville. Apparently, we found out that uh, PUV was under the city of Brownsville, 
And when that tower was constructed back in 1963, PUB did not exist. So that's why the property is under the city of Brownsville. So on, on, uh, I met with the city and I met with the school board back in, as a matter of fact, January the 14th of 2020, I made a presentation. And that week I also made a presentation with the city. And uh, a few months later, we got the property transferred from the city over to the county. And of course, uh, we started working on with, with, uh, with, the, with the school district and uh, with, with, the, with the guarantee that uh, on this particular triangle, we don't plan to build any part of the building. The tax office, which is about approximately 4,200 square feet, it's going to be situated on the actual property that was transferred from the city of Brownsville. This triangle is going to be used to get uh, the traffic in and out or into our drive through windows. Our plans call for, for a two lanes, uh, and we're going to be utilizing the, the uh, easement that's on the property, on this particular triangle, and, uh, and uh, we visited the property, and we know it's a, it's a, it's a redemption pond. It's it's going to stay as a retention pond, and uh, and I think that's what what, what uh, we 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 told the board back when. And then on March, uh, I mean May the 29th, the judge issued a letter to the superintendent uh, requesting to get on the agenda school board, guaranteeing that the property, the triangle, is going to be a retention pond. And, uh, and then, of course, that leads us to today with an uh, interlocal agreement, or MOU, uh, and it went before the commissioner's court on the 16th, and everybody agreed on this MOU, or interlocal agreement, that it will be a retention pond. Not, uh, not a single square foot of the building will sit on this particular client. It will sit on the on the uh, on the uh, acre next to it. So, uh, whatever language that you want to put uh, on your deed, uh, I don't see any problem. But the the county's uh, position is, you know, we we can't hire an architect and an engineer right now to to do plans on something that doesn't belong to us. Okay, so by, by doing this, I think er, er, everybody should be, or will be, at ease that, that this property will continue to be a rented chip on. No. And it should be. And, and to answer, uh, I think somebody made a statement that the, uh, the, the drainage for the new construction uh, might go into the, into the pond, no. The, the, all that water, excess water, will be draining to the other side of the property. So, uh, but, but uh, just to guarantee uh, or tell you guys that, that uh, it will stay as a retention pond. And, and uh, whatever, whenever the, 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 the county hires an engineer, architects, the building, the site plan will be will be uh, will 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 be asking the school school district to look at the plans, even before we request a building permit, because that's what we should be. You guys are going to be involved in the in the in the design of the of the building, the design of the property, design of the of the retention pond. Thank you, Mr. Isaguirre. And thank you for thank you. for your efforts to serving our BISD taxpayers. Does anyone else have any questions? My other colleagues, the Dr. Gutierrez. The only thing I want to say is this item will be forwarded to the April six uh, board meeting, so that uh, then we can formally bring a an agenda item for um, for the board to consider for approval. Thank you. Dr. Cantu, then uh, I guess we go back to the top now and start now with uh, item A, and then we're going to move down uh, each of those items. 
and everyone has a PowerPoint, but it's up on screen as well. So go ahead, Dr. Kantuk. So uh, I believe that agenda item will go back to the full board uh, for a vote. The agenda today, we are going to provide you an update with some ongoing projects. We also had talked about the delegation of authority, and uh, I will be giving you an update on that. Uh, we also have a consultant that has been working with us to secure better prices for energy and water, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, emergency roof repairs. We're going to give you some budget balances. Uh, and then we'll talk, as you can see on the agenda, there's some items on next steps that just bringing them back to the table to refresh everyone's uh, mind. As far as the ongoing projects, I'd like to just share with you, um, here you have the Rivera Early College High School improvements. This was out of, out of the maintenance tax note. And the work that was done there, you can see there was heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, or HVAC, the controls. We also had lighting. Um, and you can see this some pictures there. This project is completed already, and it looks beautiful. You can see the, the lighting there and also in the hallways. At Lopez Early College High School, there was two projects that were going on. One was a roof replacement, which is phase one. Uh, phase one meaning that we did not do the entire school. You can see the sections there with a white at the top over here where it says roof replacement phase one. And those um, you can see have been completed. We also have the drive and parking, the driveway and the parking area. In the front of the school, you can see a white area. And let me see if I can point using this. Th this is the front of the school. You can see the parking there. And then you see the driveway right here with additional parking also. This work at Lopez Early College High School has been completed already also. The next item that I have to share with you and give you an update is Vela Middle School. You see some bus drive improvements. And by the pictures here, you can see the work looks beautiful. There are some, um, the facilities team was informing me that there was some small uh, areas that had been requested to be um, also uh, done some, some paving on it. And so they're working on that. But the majority of the project is completed. And it's ready. It's, it's com sub uh, substantial completion. The Aquatic Center, as you know, the Aquatic Center has several things, and there was two items, two areas that are being addressed. One was the uh, heating area, which is, uh, you can see the overall is 95%. There were some new units for startup. There were controls were taken care of, and also uh, of the documentation. So that section, as far as the heating, it's overall 95% complete. The area that we're looking at is, has to do with um, some HVAC air work that is being done, and you can see that there's some areas that are at 95 percent but then there's some areas you see 45 percent there overall but that was uh, before um, the holiday before the spring break so we're now at 50 percent so those percentages have slightly gone up higher but the, that's coming along also well Canales Elementary School, there was uh, some parking and some roofing and canopies. And the picture that you see here is that parking. It is um, beautifully done. You can see there's actually some landscaping that's been completed. And there are some buildings on the, um, I don't know which side that is, Mr. Hinojosa. On the south side. There's some buildings on the south side that you can see up here, I believe, on this here, up, up here. Okay, there he goes. Now those look familiar. Okay, these buildings right here, they're very, very old buildings. Those are going to be demolished, and we're working that that project should start anytime soon. Multi-campus canopies. If you notice on this slide, we have four campuses. We have Stell, Falk, Martin, Villanueva, and all these campuses are, are substantially complete. One of the things that I do want to point out, because I noticed this as we were reviewing, you can see that at this campus, on the edges, you have those trims already completed, and at this campus, it appears that there's no trim. And so I asked what happened, you know, why are we having trim at some campuses and I was informed that the metal has been uh, there's been a delay in shipment of metal during the pandemic uh, and as they we, you know we have been receiving some as we receive it we continue to finish those minor details so while the project is substantially complete there's some areas that do need those siding or the trim the second group of multi-campus uh, canopies is uh, five campuses and you can see um, uh, pictures of several there. We have Aiken, and I, I believe all these pictures are of Aiken Elementary. The 
um, canopies being completed. You can see on these, you see the, some of the trim here. Uh, so very nice work that's uh, happening at these campuses. These are also completed. Bestato Middle School. This is a project, board members, that we have not discussed, but we wanted to bring it before you because one of the things that uh, we have as a finding, if you notice, this is the second story of Bestato Middle School. And what happens is this entrance right here leads to the stairway. And so what happens is it's a single door. And so when you have that second floor and the students are trying to get out, they're going through this one single door. It is a safety concern. It's, uh, it's something that has been there for several years, but it was brought to our attention and it's our responsibility to look into this. And so we are looking that uh, to enlarge that area. Um, construct a second a second door a double door and so that we can address the, it's a little bit more complicated than just putting another door because it is a, a fire rated wall which means it's it's supporting however um, our facilities team has evaluated this and there is a little bit of funding that's left from some of the projects so we are not asking for additional funding we're going to include it but we thought it would be important to address we don't want any this to be a safety concern for our students in the event of an emergency. Dr. Tipton? Yes, Ms. Pena. Yes, uh, and, I, and I agree 100%. And what, how would it be to look to do, just widen that whole space? You see how you can turn around when you say a second door? Instead of putting a second door, what would you, are you meaning a second door to exit to another part of the area? Or a second door right there next to that one? Instead of having the single door, Ms. Pena, if you can imagine like the boardroom, we have those double doors, so it would be a double door instead of a single and door. And my question is, what is the necessity of, of putting the door to that corridor instead of just opening it up and just have it open? Because for safety reasons, you don't want anyone to be rushing and try to open a door and, and something would block it if anything would happen. So um, let me, I know Mr. Hinojosa can help me on this, but my understanding, Ms. Pena, that's a very good question and that would be the ideal to just have more space as an opening. However, that wall, it goes all the way to the top. It is a fire rated wall, which means it's a support wall. And it would, it would cause a problem with a support system, but I'm gonna have Mr. Hinojosa. And my question is with a support system and then putting a beam to make sure you support the rest of the wall without having to put the door, you can put a beam in the middle to make sure you can turn around and support that whole firewall going to the top without having to put in the door. Yep. And I just want to know what the, why is the insistence or the necessity, the urgency to put doors and I just open it and support the beams at the top. Well, uh, Ms. Pena, the, the, um, the wall's a fire rated wall, so you have to have fire rated doors. And, they, and it empties, that's the only exit from the double loaded corridor of classrooms into a stairwell. So the whole stairwell is fire rated. So you're really going from, an, from a space into a very secured fire rated space and you're required to have fire rated doors. So the, my, my million dollar question yes. is, is it required to have doors? Okay. But uh, yes, I know that if you're gonna put doors, they have to be fire rated, but is it required, is that a mandate that once you have that, we need to enclose it? It is to be enclosed? Okay. Okay, can we get the sir, uh, some paperwork on that and, and review it if you can send us where that has that's the mandate to that type of one? Okay, okay, a um, couple of things. Let me see. First of all, uh, I think we all need to understand why there is a hazard by having that single door. The entire hold on, the, the entire hallways when the, the when the bell rings, all the kids that are on the second floor that need to take the stairwell can only go through that door. That should have never, ever been approved at all because it should be a wider opening, okay? So now, if we need to put doors, it's like any other campus that they do nowadays. You put a door, but you also put magnets. You put a magnetic door where the door opens and is held by the magnet so that when the, there's a fire drill, those magnets automatically release the door and they close themselves. That is how, w that's how they do it in public buildings, in schools. So you have to have a door because it is required, but you put a magnetic doors where you open up those doors and leave them open throughout the day. They're being held by a magnet. So at any time the, the, when there's a fire drill, then the magnet automatically re releases those doors and, it, and they close. That's the way it works. Perhaps we can look into that. I don't know, there's, th there's very limited space there, but that also is a wall that is holding up. It's a support wall 
for that for that second floor. So we have we have to design it and, and make sure that uh, we get someone to help us uh, do the best that we can and widen that opening, uh, and then at the same time be able to comply with those doors if we need to if we require to have doors. Thank you so much for the explanation. Thank you, Dr. Gutierrez. Dr. Cantu. Yes. So, uh, board members, what we're asking here um, is authorization to move forward to continue to do the work of the evaluation and so forth to be able to continue and look at expanding that uh, that door. Okay. Can we get the PowerPoint back on? Okay, that's good. Yeah. So the next item is. One of the things that um, the facilities team was charged with is to do some LED lighting. And what I want to say is we've listed three campuses, but at this time, the campuses have not been decided. We have not gone out for bid. There will be a bid. Um, there's a, an allocation of funding that was specifically set aside for LED lighting. It's to replace the existing campus with uh, white lighting luminaries with la latest energy efficient technology, which is also known as LED. So what I do want to tell you is that one of the things that the facilities team is looking is evaluating the campuses and looking at comprehensively to see, okay, is it changing just the lamps or is it changing the balance or is it having to replace the whole thing? Is there some electrical issues? So the next step, and I, what I wanted you to know, to know is that we're going out for bid on this and we will bring it back to you with uh, the specifications and, and uh, of course it needs approval from the board before we take any further action. But this is in the plan and we're moving forward with that. The next item is a SAM Stadium improvements. I know this is a one that we've been long awaiting uh, the this new uh, parking spaces. The new construction is going to add an additional 250 parking spaces. You can see that demolition has happened. There was an abatement process that needed to happen and that was completed. Demolition is about 45 percent. Um, we are looking at the material disposal is about 30 percent. I did ask um, Mr. Inojosa to work with the a contractor to give us a timeline and to see if we can as how well we can finish or as much as possible finish before the next school year uh, it's unlikely it will be completed by August but one of the things that I was uh, I asked Mr. Noah is could we say there will be additional parking available there will be a portion available so we're working with a contractor on that and we'll bring that back with more details the next area is the elementary mini the gyms. We have HVAC, as you know, this board approved that we continue to make sure that all our elementary gyms are air conditioned, and that we have restroom facilities and some offices. Uh, Ten campuses are listed here. I know some of you may not have been here when the campuses were selected, so I'd like to just share very briefly how we selected campuses. They were selected based on design, so the contractor, if there was a, s a same contractor, the design's the same, so it's easier to go in and do the 10 campuses. So that's how these campuses were selected. It is a, a $5 million budget. Uh, we are moving forward with this work um, and um, the latest on this is that the bids have been received and construction timeline is 215 days. We are bringing it to the board on April the 6th for your approval. 215 business days? Like Miss Peña was saying. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, that's very important. <laughs> yes, ma'am. It is important. Thank you. The next um, item on that I want to share with you. Good question, ma'am. It is business days. The next item is uh, FNS, the food services and uh, nutrition department, the freezer and refrigeration. The drawings have been completed. Uh, one of the things that the reason I brought this back, there was a short delay, and this was because we uh, used some of the ESSER CARES monies for this. Uh, alloc we allocated a million dollars for this project, and one of the things that we did was we included it as equipment originally for the freezer, but then we realized that there needed to be some foundation, some construction work. So we sent it back to the Texas Education Agency because it needed approval from them, and we have received approval right before spring break, so we're excited that we can move forward with the next steps on this. 
the next item on the agenda is a revised delegation of authority and just to put it to simplify the terms in the delegation of authority this is the process that we use to select either a contractor or an engineer and the process and one of the things that we brought to this board and I want to remind you and refresh your mind that one of the things that when we started looking at this we saw some things that we could improve on and so uh, on the February 11th meeting we were given approval to move forward and look into the changes so one of the things that we did the document had not been revised in years and I want to inform you that and I want to say it was 2008 Ms. 2008 was the last time it had been revised and there were some government codes that had changed so it definitely needed some revisions the one of the the changes that is being included is that there is a two-step ranking process there's a pre-qualification of submission and this will be reviewed to make sure that budget wise it meets our expectations it also includes a, a, a newly formed ranking committee and if you will recall we included uh, in the practice as a practice at BISD we had included engineers or outside people to join the committee that is changing it will only be limited to BISD employees um, we also updated the ranking criteria now in all this the new form the revised delegation of authority will not go in effect this school year it will begin with a new school year which begins July 1st um, we also changed the um, maximum awarded points uh, the district for some reason had been using 140 points and we said let's do what everyone else does at 100 points so we went to 100 points we also looked at the method of evaluation it's divided into four sections and one of the biggest things that I want to emphasize is that we wanted to eliminate subjectivity it's not about what I think or if I like this person or not it's about based on data so we uh, divided it into four sections and the four sections if you look at your uh, folder I gave you a copy I didn't include all that in the PowerPoint but what you have is a document that's highlighted in yellow those are the changes that would happen and then the second document is a ranking sheet and it's a summary of the four sections and you can see that it has for example the price it has a construction cost experience the construction team um, and then it's got the performance so those areas if we we totally eliminated subjectivity it's going to be based on data so for example number of years experience the references and so forth so that was something that we wanted to make sure that eliminate as much as possible the subjectivity and we are also requiring a minimum of five references and in that two-page document that is stapled there is a reference form that's there and I do want to add that we have worked with our technology services department and we that survey it's now a survey and it's an electronic format so that we will send it and get it immediately electronically as far as the survey so we've upgraded this delegation of authority we believe it will be uh, it, it is definitely uh, needed the revision we are happy that this revision has done and I do want to say that there is a reference check questionnaire the ranking criteria document is included and again this will not take place until July 1st so I, w I would like to let you know that the committee the facilities along with the maintenance along with our CFO along with our purchasing department spent several meetings you know finalizing and fine-tuning because there was some disagreements at times and we were okay explain and so forth so it took a lot for the team I want to congratulate the team for spending countless hours on the revision but at this time I'd like to pause in case you have any questions on the forms Ms. Pena form where you have the Brownsville Independent School District delegation of authority the one you put in our folder and uh, some of the lines that were crossed off and from where I'm hearing you say that they're going to be included but I guess you're moving them to other parts of it can you just get me a form that reference to where exactly you put this for example financial information you crossed it out on page one so financial financial information of the person wanting to have the job uh, given to them where did you put that in because that's very pertinent to see who we're working with and what their their strength is. I don't know if you've heard about there's some companies out that have yet to pay some of the the bills to the construction and so the people are putting liens on their properties, the big companies. I want to make sure that doesn't happen to BISD. Yes, thank you, Ms. Peña, for asking. What you have here, the several pages, the documents that is um, stapled, it lines up to this document that has this. So if you noticed, 
the four categories, if we go to the, the ranking summary page, which is a one page summary, if you notice price is at the very beginning, it's at the very top, and we are, we are actually doing it as staggered. So instead of doing five points if you're the highest and zero points if you don't, you know, if, if you're the lowest or whatever that may be, we did a staggered system. So that way everyone gets some points. The better price gets more points versus the, the, the so you can see that it is a, a staggered system. The number of points that they can get is up to 40 points in price. But if you're the lowest bidder, you're going to get the 40 points. If you're the, the, the highest bidder, you're going to get 24 points. So you can see the differences that everyone gets points and it also allows for that difference in, um, in the ranking system. Okay, okay. Yes. I, I understand this, what you just told me, but it doesn't answer the question because of the financial information, proof of financial stability, proof of pre-qualification submission. That's not in there at the very top where you say that it is. I don't see it in that. Ms. Because yes. it, I, I'm confused because this one it says what they're going to see, what each bidder gets, low bid, high bid, second bid, third bid. And over here, it's their uh, stability and their backing and their strength of the company that's going to come into the business with us. Thank where you. are you going to ask that? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to have Mr. Uh, Robledo help me and I may also ask our purchasing office. Um, just yes. before we move forward. The way I understand it, Ms. Peña, and, and I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that it's a two-step. So I don't think that the bid will move forward because it's a pre-qualification for proof of financial stability, which you yes. mentioned, and it's very I just important. Know where it's so written. I don't think that it's part of the actual ranking point because it would have never moved that, forward. That's what I thought, but that's why when she okay. said that this is here, that's not how I see it. I see it the way you're seeing it. Correct, yes. Thank, Mr. Thank, thank you, Dr. Tipton. So just to elaborate on some of those items, so back to where it used to be 140 points, now we have 100 points. So some items got moved around. So when we talk about financial position or financial strength, you notice that on page four of the document where we list all the different uh, points given, that financial strength was crossed out, which is that 20 points that we had initially talked about. But if you read a little bit further into the document, it's kind of now part of that um, construction performance professionalism based on the reference check questionnaire. So those, not necessarily that those 20 points of the financial piece got moved, it's now from a 140 point scale down to a 100 scale. But some of those items is still within the criteria of the remaining, the, the new criteria. And I understand, but what the operative was kind of in there, that's my thing. Because if I, you read I want the document, that, that's where it would show. It would show, but it, I, I have to have the explanation for it. And I wanted it to be like where it used to be. It was very simple. There was no trying to find it. And that's one thing when we, when working with the state, they always say write a document where anyone, a lay person can pick it up and understand what you're saying and not confuse them where they have to turn to page B to get the answer from page A. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm asking. It is straightforward. Yeah, right, right. But here where it says financial information, and on the page you tell me that they're going to put it in. I'm sorry, was that page four you said? So, so in other words, on page one, mm -hmm. financial information, 20 points, is now deleted. So because that's no longer a, a criteria. Tell me why the financial information is not a criteria. Because on page four, you put the word price. You don't put financial information. So you're saying it's in price? The financial information would have been like the financials of the company, exactly which we will then about. now be part of the actual uh, reference check. Where is that in here? On page one, no? On where it describes the, um, all those items, the pre-qualifiers. So it says, um, and, yes. and at the end of so bottom one, it says yes. provide one. one. Yes, it does. But that's why I'm asking, why did they cross it out up there, but it's still in there at the bottom? Because it's now no longer a criteria. So it's no longer it's a part criteria. of the process. Yeah, okay. it's part of the process for the reference check now. Okay. But it's not necessarily its own criteria for 20 points. See, what you're, in other words, you moved it from the point system. It just happened to be where it's, it got it's, moved. It's a, but there's me. other parts where there's other points that are no longer now part of that uh, scale. Because in the past, and, and I'm looking at page four, there used to be 140 points. Well, now there's only 100. And so some of the criteria did change, but it got either combined with another section or it was deemed something that is irrelevant. And then now the newer version is what we're going to be using for 
the criteria for selecting a company. What I would like to add, if I may, uh, thank you, Mr. Robledo, is that one of the things that we did as a committee was we looked at our neighboring districts to see, okay, let's look at some examples. Let's look at what they're doing. And so one of th the findings was that almost everyone uses the 100 points. We also saw that there was simplified language. Instead of having eight to 10 categories, let's group it into larger buckets. So as what Mr. Robledo is mentioning, well, it may have the language was deleted as far as the title, but it's embedded in one of the four criteria that is listed on the summary page. So you, you know, the price obviously is very important. The construction experience, the company experience, you know, the number of years in business, the experience in school construction. And that was very important because and one of the questions we were asking was experience in construction well somebody may know how to make a, a mall but not necessarily the rules of a of a school for example so we want it specific uh, to schools also the similar size and scope of uh, complexity so when you're building a school there's different rules about construction on height depending on the, the, if it's for the elementary students or the secondary students and so we wanted do they have experience with that type of complexity? It's not just construction. So we broke it down. You can see, and then you look at construction team and subcontractors experience, the project management. And we want to know who are the subcontractors because we want to know, are, do they have a reputation that is valid, that is that they're reliable, that they're going to finish on time. What is that reputation? And then number four, where it has construction performance and professionalism, this is going to be based on that reference check questionnaire. And it's going to be, this is a survey I was talking about, that's going to be quality of work, the history of meeting deadlines. That's going to be very important. The ability to resolve project issues, um, the project documentation, the closing the project, and then their safety record. And so if you notice, some of the items that were uh, on the original form have been placed into one of these four categories. Uh, and what we did was anything that was subjective, we removed and we made it to where now we're going to look at specific years experience, specific number of people in the committee and so forth. So it's based on data. Dr. Tipton? Yes, Ms. Peña. Yes, on page four, where you uh, scratched out um, on the criteria of financial strength. Where is that one listed? Because another one I see very well where you crossed out like professionalism and conflict resolution and then you put it down construction performance, professionalism, and you went from 10 there for 20 points for both. Where did you put financial strength? Ms. Peña, can I ask you to join me at the podium, Ms. Peña? Um, I know this. Ms. Peña, I wanted to add something as, as well so that way they can ho hopefully they can address it. But um, Dr. Cantu, I wanted to go back to page one on the pre-qualifiers, which are, those are the 40 points where Ms. Peña is making reference to, right? And on there, it's uh, items one all the way to number eight. And I mean, I would recommend, you know, that perhaps we can quantify, not be part of the 100, but still be part of the pre-qualifiers. But still, there's some areas where we can quantify because I wouldn't know what n how to rank them. For example, um, it says there, a review audited financial statement may be submitted but will result in some deduction of points. What is the point spread there? You see on number, for example, on number six? Mm -hmm. How does the committee move forward without, you know, there being a scale there? Um, and the other one that I see is also, let me see where it says, Maybe number one, you know, provide one or more letters of reference from a bank with regards to the company's financial standing and strength. I mean, I don't know how you would rate, you know, if it's a good letter, if it's not a good letter. And so I think that maybe we can put some, you know, we can quantify these pre-qualifiers. Just my recommendation. That's a definitely Still not option. part of the 100 points, but. Come up with some sort of a matrix. Some, maybe. some matrix, you know, to make it easier for the ranking committee. I don't know my my other colleagues if they want to chime in. Ms. No, I agree with you, what you're saying, Dr. Tipton. I have those same concerns. We can certainly uh, come up with a, the rubric using this th indicators, and then um, it would not be a part of the 100 points, Correct. But, for the but that way we can see it in writing as far as a rubric. Correct. That's a good recommendation. Yeah. Since we're going to be talking about the financial st stability of the company or, or the organization, that's also consider the insurance if they're bonded you know mm -hmm. th that needs to be there uh, that's part of, yeah. okay 
Yeah, yes. but, but we need to make sure that there's that a scale. That's, yeah. that's a priority because mm -hmm. if we, we want to make sure that our that their work, you know, has insurance in case in the event that we need to, you know, yes, fix um, it up. Yes, great point, Dr. Gutierrez. And Ms. Peña was mentioning to me, whenever we put um, a request for either proposals or qualifications, that's part of the requirement. They have to be bonded. If they are not bonded and they submit documentation, they're removed. But that's a part of the actual qualifications, not necessarily on the scoring. But it's there. Good point, sir. But we can certainly work on a rubric there. Anyone else? We're good. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cantu. You're very welcome, ma'am. I would like to just again thank the committee that's been working on this, uh, both facilities and maintenance. And we also had our CFO in our purchasing department. It's, it's been some long hours and long conversations on this, but I think we're headed in the right direction with this. The next item has to do with the update on energy and water consulting. As you know, our district um, hired Energy Smart Corporation to evaluate the cost from the different um, uh, power sources. And one of the things that we found out is that um, the rate that we pay for uh, PUB, and, and let me back up a little bit first. Um, before the freeze, there was a negotiation uh, with our consultant that there would be a discount, uh, a percentage of discount for the 18 campuses that you see there. there. However, the freeze came and uh, PUB is now having um, to deal with ERCOT and other issues and they withdrew the recommendation to do a discount. If you notice on the bold paragraph that you see here, I included the language that they said that uh, the board the, when they took it to the board on March the 5th, uh, it was not accepted. Now, in conversations with our consultant, PUB is willing to consider in the future to give us a discount. But right now with ERCOT and the issues that they have to deal with, uh, this is not the right time for them. So the other option that we have, there's only one other option that our consultant brought to my attention. These 18 campuses, we can move power from PUB to AEP. And the reason for that is that AEP, uh, the, the amount paid for kilowatt is almost half than what we pay with PUB. So there would be a significant savings, a projected savings of about 500000 a year. However, there is a cost up front because any time you change from one power company to another, um, the equipment belongs to the other company and so disconnecting and exiting and so forth um, we have been told has to be paid that cost so that everyone knows and being very transparent is about three hundred thousand dollars for these 18 campuses it the exiting fees yeah and, and if I may and the yes, reason Ms. is Finney? and they're very protective because let me just give you an example a neighborhood is being powered by CPNL but you want PUB because you're getting better light. Well, CPNL says, knock yourself out. <coughs> Just pay $10,000 up front to put in your own pole because they own all of the materials and all of the poles and the, and the lines. So yes, there is, now here's what I wanna say. With $300,000, do we have on paper how much savings it'll be? Well, so to make sure that we give that information to the public so they'll know it's gonna cost 300,000, but we're gonna save in the long run 500,000 in five years, you know what I'm saying? Yes, it's actually a um, good question, Ms. Peña. The 18 campuses, we're looking at 500,000 a year in savings. So the first year we would make up the 300,000 that we would pay up front to exit with PUB mm -hmm. and switch over to AEP. Ms. Uh, thank you, Ms. Peña. Ms. Gonzalez? Thank you. Um, does PUB know that we have the option to change providers? Yes, yes, ma'am, they do know. Um, I asked our consultant if they had been informed that we could get a better kilowatt charge with AEP. And his uh, comment to me was they were informed, and at this point they weren't willing to drop that charge of the kilowatts to match AEP. That's unfortunate. Thank you. And if I may ask? Ms. Pena? Have we? I know. I, I, I'm very uncomfortable with middlemen all my life. Well, have we actually had someone from BISD actually contact PUB to get that information so they can really understand what is going on to give them an opportunity so we won't find out, hey, well, we didn't know that, so we can we get it straight from PUB and not a third party? 
one of the things that um, the reason Ms. Benya we hired a consultant is because um, school district employees are not allowed to negotiate or to discuss those fees with the company the, you know we want to stay away from that however one of the things that we are doing is if the board um, wishes we will bring this back to the full board to, at, you know, to approve the cost of the 300000 and the letter that will be sent to PUB will be directly from our superintendent so anytime a communication is sent from the consultant our superintendent signs a memo Yes. So uh, let me finish real quick. So you're saying that the law says the superintendent cannot talk to anyone in reference to the power. The law mandates that we have to go through a consultant to turn around and speak to the people at the PUB before we decide we're going to change companies. Well, we can I get that? Let where me that is, I please? Let me let me answer. Okay, we have a consultant that is uh, representing us on our behalf. Okay, he's our voice and he's negotiating with PUB. PUB had uh, called me, I got a call from them that they were going to um, work with us and give us uh, a 20% discount on these campuses. And I believe I reported that to the board, that uh, they were gonna work on it. Unfortunately, there was a freeze. There was a lot of problems in the state. We all know that. And then that 20% savings per campus was off the table, okay? And did this go to the board? Did the this what? go to the to the PUB board? Uh, I believe he said that the, they had discussed it with the board and that they had agreed that they were going to award us the twenty percent discount per campus, as our consultant was requesting. But then the the freeze came in, and then um, that uh, then they backed off from that offer. We well, that offer is no longer on the table. So now, but we have options. And our option is that was plan A. We wanted to work with them. We wanted to be able to get the discounts through them because uh, our consultant was working with them that, uh, and showing data that uh, this is about the savings that we could get from them per campus and, and they agreed. But unfortunately we had that freeze. Now they can't do this because uh, obviously you know all the problems with the state uh, with our cut and the things that went on and, and the we did not get those that discount anymore is no longer an option for us through them but the district needs to look at its best interest and so plan b is that we can switch providers and we have 18 campuses that are allowable to switch providers and if we switch providers there is a savings for the district in that amount according to our consultant uh, it pays itself to those 300,000 to switch providers it pays itself from the savings and you're looking at savings moving forward every year. So, uh, you know, we want to work with whomever can give us the best and final offer to BISD and to look after are in our best interest. And right now in our best interest from what it looks like is to switch providers. Unless PUB can come back and say, we will match your AEP provider, but we haven't had that offer yet. Who's so our consultant, if I may ask? What's his? It's Mr. Bob Driggers with Energy Smart Corporation. Yes, and as Dr. Gutierrez mentioned, uh, this did go to their board and that's where it was not approved. So again, this is to inform you that w Plan B is looking at changing our provider from PUB to AEP. And we will bring that back to the full board for approval. And if I may? Ms. Pena? Uh, just to you know, make sure, uh, can the, our consultant consult them again and tell them, since you can't give us any kind of donation, we are going to be pulling out to make sure that they get the proper opportunity to know that this is what we're doing because we have to look out for the best interest of the district and the best savings and that way they won't say that they were not aware of this you know what i'm saying because time has changed and i don't know if they know that we are really actually looking at pulling out because they can't better our rates miss mm -hmm. i think that did they did you mention doctor that you were going that you were going to submit a letter on your behalf w yes once we are get a uh, board approval that uh, we can switch over providers will send them a letter and notify oh. them I think no no Ms. no Ms. wanting it before before oh, before do it before sir not okay. you know after the case because then oh. i don't want you to make a meet with someone else and then we get a better way with them so can you please do that before just to make sure that we get the best for the district okay because i don't want to go to a new provider and we get a wonderful rate for two three years and then all of a sudden oopsie Yes, 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 uh, to be out of respect, just place it on notice that this is our plan because we have to get our district. 
Maybe better. I just don't know. Can can we submit an intent before it comes to the prior board or this legal? I don't know that he can submit an intent, but maybe he can s let them know what we are p looking into doing. It's not more. How would I do that, sir? Mr. Salinas, what is it? Yes, one of the things that Mr. Um, Salazar mentioned is to request um, that they do the last and final offer to see if there's any opportunity for a change on the cost. Thank you, Mr. Salazar. Ms. Jessica? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, can you tell me those numbers again? The how much we would save and how much it would cost to switch providers? The upfront cost to exit uh, PUB, uh, the equipment, it's uh, about $300,000. The um, return that we would get on a yearly basis is five hundred thousand dollars projected. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. What's the difference in the kilowatt? I believe I the AEP, um, AEP I want to say it's four cents a kilowatt versus the PUB it's seven or eight cents, Miss Peña. I don't remember exactly, but it's almost double. Okay. Uh, I do want to mention that this. Um, there will be a memo uh, as requested to you know give us their best and final offer and then we will bring that to the board um, the consultant did inform me that he is looking at sealing a contract with them for 10 years so whatever rate they give us uh, that would be sealed for 10 years now there is a cost additional cost that has to do with fuel and things like that 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 there's no control they can't set that portion of it but the cost per kilowatt he's gonna his attempt is to lock it for 10 years if I may <laughs> Because you bring up a good point. I want to make sure that we don't get good kilowatts, but in the fuel, shoom, they make up their loss. That's what we have to be really careful, ladies and gentlemen, because everything's in the small print and this is public money. So, can you make sure that you guarantee that any of that money will not supersede? And at the end of the day, we don't have a savings and we went through an expense. I want to make sure that happens. I we think what would be helpful yeah. is a recommendation, like Ms. Peña mentioned, is for AEP to give us that quote as well. Yeah. We're trying so to we get the compare. best for the district because right now we're not getting better rates. I think everybody would agree that there's outside providers that have better rates than what we're currently paying. And we're paying a lot more than we shouldn't be paying. And that's been a problem. And, uh, you know, we got to look after BISD. And I agree with that. Just make sure that you look at every little charge and cost because it can be real great over here. And then another fuel stuff, they can come back and balance themselves. Out. Please make sure that doesn't happen to BISD. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. You want to you mention? Go ahead, Dr. Clinton. The next item, uh, board members, is one that you have not seen and you, we have not talked about in previous facility committee meetings, but I thought it was very important that we bring it to you. One of the things that, um, as our facilities team was working at Canales Elementary, uh, we had a, a very interesting finding. Um, as they were working with the HVAC that sits on top uh, or on the roof of a campus, we actually had a roofer that went through um, the ceiling. Upon further investigation, um, and I like the language that uh, our facilities team used, that it's an orthodox roof system. This facility was built in the 50s, so uh, mm. many, many, many years ago. And so the, uh, the supplies that they used for roofing are very different from what we use now. You've got moisture seeping through. And so this is a true safety concern that we are very worried about because our HVAC systems in the district sit on top of our, our roofs of the campuses. So when we had that finding, the request to our facilities team was check to see which other campuses have this roof. And what we learned is that there was a engineer and a contractor that came from California and built um, three of our schools. Uh, Canales back in the 50s from California yeah back in the 50s not now and so we found that there was three campuses that were built uh, our facilities team investigated and they used the same uh, process for the roof and so we have Cromac that has 19 classrooms we have Martin that has 40 classrooms and what I asked our facilities team we have to notify our board because this is a safety concern I don't want a HVAC unit to fall through the roof and hurt a child or a staff member. So this is an what I would call an emergency situation. This was a finding we were not anticipating. It is at a cost approximately, and let me tell you how we based this cost. This cost was based on what we did 
for Canales Elementary. We're repairing the, that um, classroom. There's three classrooms right now that we're repairing. So this cost is based on what we did at Canales. There's still some engineering costs. There's still some things that you know slightly might be included and might add to the cost. But what I wanted to bring to you is that um, we have done an evaluation of all our other campuses, and the other campuses are fine. Uh, these are the canales which is being addressed uh, today, but we have Cromac and Martin that need to be addressed. And so at this time, I'm requesting that we seriously consider locating funds for a replacement roof uh, for this. And just to give you an idea of the process, the unorthodox system, Mr. Hinojosa was kind enough to bring us a sample of what that looked like. Let me see if I can explain it, and I don't know the inches, but it had cardboard, the lower layer, a section of cement, and a plywood on the top. That was the roof. Water has seeped through, and it seeped through the wood, through the concrete, and that's why it's coming through. I don't know <laughs> the thinking on that. I asked Mr. Hinojosa. I'm not a contractor, but I know that we don't use cardboard for roofs. So, so this was many years, years ago. I'm impressed that it's lasted 50 years. <laughs> My hat's off to that. Because I mean, no, listen to what you're listen to what you're saying. No, no. Well, and no, uh, yeah. I'm sure they stepped on it when they put that because they replaced the HVAC, sir. I'm sorry. So listen to what you're saying. 50 years and it survived. So that is wow. a positive way to look at it, ma'am. That yeah. is a positive. Yeah. Huh? 70 years. Se 70 years? Wow. So that's an impressive number. Right <laughs> now, you get roofs that they collapse within five or six years. <laughs> so 70 years. Oh my goodness. So it's a great way to look at it. It worked. No offense. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there must yes, be a science to it. And with time, everything wears out and we need to replace. But yeah, because apparently 70 years, ma'am, wow, that's very interesting. So how, how thick was it? Like four or five inches thick at best? The uh, <laughs> It was a composite roof. And there was they put uh, what they call a lightweight concrete of three inches. And they put it on a deck of three inch like insulation board. And, and you know, when it's dry, it's strong. But what happened was throughout the years when they re-roofed it a while back, they put plywood on top because they couldn't anchor to the con lightweight concrete. And when, when the seal broke during the time that, that it started to leak, the water dissolved the, the plywood. Then they went and dissolved or saturated the lightweight concrete. And then the deck that hel held up the concrete it also turned into mush. And so you really don't have anything up there. That's, that's, your, that's your roof, your roof system. So what, if I may, so what yes. happened was, I'm sorry. So okay. what happened was when they tried to repair, the repair was not done properly and it jeopardized the whole roof because the water that sipped through destroyed that material that was used. Am I correct? Well, the, 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 the top layer had a breach, and it's possible they could have in any one of these. And I think what we're trying to do is make sure that, that uh, the other ones that uh, have a, they're constructed the same way don't get to the point where they become dangerous. So this is an item that we'll definitely need to come back and request a budget for that. Yes, uh, ma'am. Dr. Cantu, I have a question. And do we have a history of of how many times the we've re-roofed, I guess that's the term, Canales, Cromac, and Martin. I mean, I, I'm just concerned because I, I do, you know, I mean, I've only been here two years, but I have heard that it's just constant roof repairs, you know, and I just want to make sure that, you know, we're not going, you know, I, that we're holding, the co like Ms. Peña mentioned, you know, the contractors accountable, right? And we go back to that rubric of, you know, their bonding. Yes, um, I don't have that with me, um, <laughs> but it's something that we can definitely look into this. You know, one of the things that Mr. Noah's explained is that a roof is usually 15 to 20 years. I think that's okay. what you told me, 15 to 20 years. So it served its purpose. And yes. I, like Ms. Peña's thinking that we should be glad it lasted this long. Uh, as long as we didn't re-roof last year that, you know, to, you know, within the five years. So I, I certainly bring that. Yeah, back. I would, you know, I think it'd be good for the board to, to know if it's something that we're going to look into and it's already been re-roofed. I will bring that back, ma'am. I will send that to you. 
The next item is budget balances. And of course, that's always very, very important. How much money do we have less, uh, left? It's self-explanatory, but I'm going to ask Mr. Uh, Robledo to quickly summarize the three different funds that we have. And so when we see the titles, so the tax rate increase, we just want to make sure that there's three funds that have been historically used for construction purposes. So back in 2017, and we had raised about 59 million. Those funds had been broken down to this list of different projects. Um, and as the time has gone on since 2017, now those funds are really worked towards the end of all uh, of, of all of the projects and the uses of these funds. Um, some and they're in the largest amount on top to the smallest amount. And so we do see here that one item that we already talked about has been the elementary mini gyms. So in grand total, we do have that $17 million set aside, but we're just doing it in phases. And so, but the majority of the other items have already been completed and in a sense, the monies have already been spent. The maintenance tax note, again, these are monies that was taken as a loan. So a note is a loan. Um, back in 2017, um, we do earn interest on the monies that we haven't spent yet. So that's why we initially had 52 million. We've earned some interest of 2 million. And so in the grand total with the 54 million, we have now in a sense spent the majority of it also. Um, again, some of the big topic items have always been the, the, uh, the HVAC or the heating and um, the heating, the AC work, um, the HVAC. And so um, again, most of these items have already been completed. Probably the biggest thing that's still left here is the roof replacement. And I know the last few items that deal with uh, the energy build and uh, the energy items. The last item is the tax rate election. <coughs> um, again, back in 2015, um, the district had gone through um, a tax swap, I guess that's another way of thinking of it, where monies were being collected more at the state level. And so now the district had decided way back when to use those funds for construction purposes. And so, um, so for those years back in 2015 and year 17, um, about 16 million was collected. And so with that, different projects were, were, com were being completed. Probably the one thing that is still pending is there at the Veterans Memorial um, for the ticket booths. And so I know uh, our facilities department is working real hard to get those items uh, completed, but the majority of the other items have already been, again, done. But if you notice for all three um, buckets of money, the very bottom number, pretty much all the items have either been budgeted to spend all or they've already been spent. And so, um, so another way of thinking of it, all of our monies have already been kind of uh, utilized. Um, yes, I have a question. And I know that Ms. Lopez Valdez and I were talking earlier and I, and I, was, I couldn't answer her question because it wasn't on the presentation. Because I do notice that in the past, we've had another column where it actually has the percentage complete or a status of the project. Like you mentioned, complete or it's maybe, you know, 90% complete or 100 so I think that, you know, that would be a recommendation. I think we've seen it before, okay. and I don't know why it was deleted this time. And, and, and so what was happening before, um, and I'll make it up, let's say six months ago, we still had uh, projects that we were adding to the list. And so we had monies that were uh, not allocated to. And so the numbers we have here is what we kind of call actuals and committed, meaning that there's actually a purchase order out there with a vendor or the money has already been spent. Um, and so... I think the column is, um, just to be more clear, the column that we, we would like to see is, you know, the percentage complete. And, and right? I know that's why on the pictures we show the percentage complete, but we'll go ahead and add that. I think that would be great. And then I have another question. on um, And going back to that point, for example, the middle school four-lane tracks, I understand that the tracks for Bastedo, Luso, and Vela have been complete, correct? That is correct. Yes. And uh, my concern is that those have been recently complete. I mean, when was... I want to say last year. 
one is, right? 2020. Yes, in, in, in 2020. Okay, and I'm mentioning that because I did have some community members and some constituents call and mention that there were already some issues with um, the construction of those middle school lane tracks, and I just want to make sure that, you know, that we're contacting the contractor or that we're working those issues out. Can we get an update? Yes, ma'am. Um, I am aware of those concerns, and they have been brought to our attention also from our athletic department. And um, right now, we, the, we are looking at working with the contractors. They have been notified. Uh, I believe Mr. Uh, Salinas is also aware. So we are beginning the process. Um, and so, yes, we are um, following up to hold them accountable. Yes. And going back to that column, I think those notes are really important for us so that way when we, you know, when we get a call, we, you know, we know how to respond to our constituents. We'll add that percentage column for the next. If we move along, uh, I'd like to share with you some maintenance department updates. And what I'd like to do is, uh, I'm not going to read each of these to you, but what you can see is that maintenance uh, services continues to be very busy. They, uh, 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 they help maintain 74 facilities and 54 campuses. The numbers that you see there are the number of work orders. So for example, uh, they received 12,000, a little bit over 12,000 work orders, 10,000 have been completed. And then you have the pending, you also have some emergencies there. So this is just to give you a high level overview of the number of work orders that the maintenance department continues to work on. The next slide here talks about the ongoing projects, equipment and supplies purchased. And you can see that there, the trade is very, it varies. It could be electrical, it could be plumbing. Um, and you can see, for example, when the pandemic started, the, the installing the plexiglass at all the front office counters, not only at the campuses, but at the departments. And you can see on the far right, it, those that were completed. And you can see, for example, hand sanitizer dispensers and products. Those have been received and they are installing as we speak, but they're not completed yet. Um, the last item is uh, one that I wanted to spend just a quick minute to explain why we did this. If you notice that it is a PPE kit, one of the things that we found is that we heard from our custodians that some of them were concerned, rightfully so, concerned that if there was a positive case, they were going into a classroom to disinfect and they were concerned about their own safety. So one of the things that we decided to do was to make them a kit. We made kits for teachers, so we made a kit for our custodians. And the kit included the items that you see there, including, for example, a disposable gown. So that way they don't feel like, okay, it could get on my clothes or it could get on, you know, the shoe covers, uh, the shoes, uh, gloves, um, microfiber wipes, and so forth. So we, each custodian uh, will receive the one kit per campus. And so you can see that some of them have been, uh, they were received and delivered to all the campuses. So it was just an extra precaution for our custodians. The next item has to do with LED lighting. And you can see uh, that, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> that we have some questions. <laughs> yes, Miss uh, Jessica Gonzalez and then Miss Minerva Fing. Thank you. Uh, quick question regarding the PPE. Is that something that we still have available uh, for staff, maintenance, I anybody who, who needs it? They just need to ask? Yes, ma'am. Um, at every principal's meeting, we provide uh, an update for our principals about PPE. One of the things that Dr. Gutierrez approved uh, just this week, uh, or actually he's been emphasizing it, was that we send out um, disposable masks, the blue ones, to all the campuses. And because we do have an inventory at the warehouse, we're sending those out as we speak. So yes, uh, we also have hand sanitizer. We have um, other PPE supplies that the principal may request. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Peña? Yes. Going back to page seven, uh, 32, in reference to the Oh, yes, this one? Mm -hmm. Let me ask Mr. Uh, Lopez uh, to help me with a response on this. I believe I know the response, but let me give you an opportunity. 
Good evening, um, board members, superintendent, everyone. Okay, uh, if you see on the work order stats, the dates, it's uh, from July 2020 to, m to date, which is March 2021st. So we may have uh, items that are still pending that are before that date. So it doesn't necessarily add to the, to the range. So from July 2020 to March 2021st, we received 12,000, but we have received before those dates, before the, uh, before that date range. So what I'm, I guess what I'm asking is, you've yes. completed more, you just haven't added that total to the completed, am I correct? Is that what's happened? Because if you notice, uh, the 12,155 subtract 10,113 is 2,042 pending, but you have 1660, which is 382 that are not included. So what you're telling me is that some of them might have been completed but not put into this total. Is that possible that's, to happen? That's always correct because okay. uh, the system is not updated daily, but also we have items that are outside the range of the dates. Um, possibly uh, um, previous prior uh, school year that we have to wait until there's available funding or we have to schedule for the summer or uh, different reasons. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Garcia. And just in addition to the PPE, just want to make sure that anyone that's assigned to the school has access to PPE. Uh, as long as they're in that school, they should be part of that school and they should have access to anything that's available at that school. Because uh, we get reports that sometimes they say, well, uh, you're not part of the school, you're but not part of it. Again, if they're assigned there, they are part of that school. So they should be treated as such. Yes, sir. Yes, and I, I do want to, I have a recommendation. I don't know what my other board colleagues may think, but um, to support the campus needs, I think that um, a recommendation is it would be better for me to see out of those 74 facilities or 54 out of where are these 12,000 orders at? And only, you know, because we want to make sure that we're supporting our campuses and we just want to make sure that there's, you know, we don't have these unorthodox <laughs> rules, right? Um, that we're just patching up things, right? And so any number, high number that's alarming to us at, as a campus for me, I would like to see this 12,155. I'm sure they're getting it from some matrix. Um, if we can just add that on, I don't know what my other colleagues think. Uh, we have that data, um, Dr. Tipton. And one of the things I know that I asked Mr. Lopez to print them for me at one time, and it was about, um, I don't know, five inches of paperwork because each work order is one page, so it's uh, that amount of paper. But there's certainly a way that we could do maybe an electronic copy to provide it for you. And no, that just by just how many camp I mean, how many work orders are going in per campus? I mean, we don't per necessarily campus. need the we don't necessarily need the backup just per campus, right? I, okay, I misunderstood. Thank you. Yes. yes. We're, we're not asking for the detail, but the number of orders, not the specific because details. Because if we see order. a high number and, you know, and we need to support the campus in other areas, we need to. So you're looking at a summary by campus or department? Yeah, just a number. Got just it. A number. That we can do. A number per campus? Do you, for do example, you out of the 12,155, where, where did those orders? Okay. And do you care about the breakdown if it's electrical, plumbing, or? Or just I just think numbers. just a high number in each campus okay. would give us an idea if there's that, some... That's very doable. We have it. Yes, exactly. Yes. We'll get that to you. Mr. Lopez, if you'll make a note. Thank you. So the next slide that I'm going to jump into has to do with the LED lighting, the projects district-wide. You can see on the far left the name of the campus. You can see the location of the work and the, the areas that have been completed or are in progress. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice, the libraries is a common um, uh, area that's being, um, the LED lighting is being completed. As you know, we are renovating our libraries through our LIBOR grant. So this is a part, we include it as a part of a, a renovation. The other items that, um, 
this board approved for our maintenance team to begin uh, in January. The intercom replacements, uh, they are doing the analysis. They're still going campus by campus to evaluate what is it? Is it, uh, do we need to add electrical? Do we need to add just a device? So there's some an uh, assessment. It's, it is in progress as we speak. There was a campus, Vermilion Elementary, that, that was at what we called an emergency. It did not have a system at all. And so that one uh, is being replaced as we speak. Playground structures, One, this is an area that uh, was approved by our board and uh, we attended the, the ribbon cutting ceremony at one of our campuses and I'd like to report that we now have seven campuses completed and I do have um, a couple pictures that I'd like to show you. I, it's not in the PowerPoint, but I certainly want to add them for you or just show them to you. If I may, Doctor? Yes, Ms. Pena. I just want to comment on the playgrounds because the other day I was driving by a school and my granddaughter was in the car and she literally sh shouted out to me, Grandma, look at that playground. So whatever, you, I mean, for this four-year-old to just, she was so, that's a school. And so she was so excited. So thank you for putting them in because it really brings out the wanting to get out there and moving and, and interacting with other children. So thank you. They're very bright colors. And just driving behind, it was ugly. Just driving behind, it just grabs your eyes because of the color. And that's a very big plus for our students and our campuses. So thank you for that. Thank you, ma'am. So what you see here is one campus, um, but we do have seven campuses. And just so that you know which campuses, is Del Castillo, Keller, Gallegos, Bright, Benavides, Breton, and Egley. Those are the seven that are completed. The next group of campuses are being also um, you know, there's a, there another, this is Benavides um, also, a different angle, or you can see. Um, so our students are very excited for, uh, with this new equipment. Mr. Garcia. And this is great. This is something that was approved before the pandemic. And uh, well, it's gonna be perfect for when the kids come back, the children come back, they're gonna have something to look forward to. So thank you for that. Thank you, and Mr. If I may, with that said, um, it came out on the news the other day, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because you know the six feet of distance when we come back in face. Now they're saying they're cutting it down. No, three feet's going to be okay. It's going to be safe. Have you heard about that? So, so I'm hoping and praying that the day comes soon where we go back down to the way we one foot, because that's okay. how far apart they were in the beginning. So I'm listening to that. So that gives me hope because they're giving us more space to be able to have our students and not worry that they're not going to fit in class. So. Thank you for that, and let's stay on, on top of that, see what happens. Thank you so much for the support there. Uh, it is a very rewarding um, playground equipment for our students. The last one, I'm going to not elaborate so much because we already talked about the energy and water uh, services, the consulting. The next item was the property, the transfer property, which we have discussed. This next item has to do with HVAC and ventilation system. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have been informed is that there is some new funding coming in. I do want to clarify at this point that we don't know if it's going to be supplemental. We don't know if it's going to be supplanting. We don't have guidelines right now. But one of the things that we do know it's going to include is HVAC. And if you notice that the chart at the bottom, it has the, 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 the sequence. Right now, this bill is called the Reopen and the Rebuild America Schools Act. Um, it has been introduced to the House. That's where it's at right now. You can notice that it's going to go through the, it needs to be passed through the House, passed through the Senate, it goes to the President, and then it becomes law. But this is what we know right now, and we wanted to inform you uh, so that you know. This legislation was introduced, it's comprehensive, and it's going to address several things. One of the most important things that this bill is going to uh, focus on is facilities that pose a health and safety risk for students and staff. And it's obviously to combat the virus. It also is going to include high-speed broadband uh, and digital learning. There's also conversation that it, it's going to include mental health. And so there's other components. As I said, this is just at an introductory uh, situation. The allocation is $100 billion at the national level. From there, uh, one of the things, as I mentioned, the big focus of the Education Committee is that half of the schools uh, across the country need improvement in their HVAC system. And obviously, we have some schools that are uh, a little old, and so definitely would fit into that category. 
one of the things that we are already exploring is the fact that whatever funding we get, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what is expected, but one of the things that we do know is that we want to follow the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, and the acronym is there, and also CDC. They have guidelines regarding ventilation in buildings. Um, these CDC recommends a layered strategy to reduce the, the virus, the spread of the virus. And so what I'd like to tell you is that there's three areas that are being, that are recommended. And usually uh, the engineer completes this work and then what they do is they look at three areas. Dilution, which is increasing fresh air, right? And just making sure that we have systems that, that we have the capacity to do that. Priority two is filtration, and that has to do with providing higher efficiency filters. And I'd like to inform this board and also our community, because I think this is very important, that our filters uh, across the district and in all our facilities were at a lower grade, and we have upgraded it to a more of 11 or a 12, which is hospital grade. And, and, and so we are very happy to say that those have been replaced already district-wide. And again, I'd just like to repeat that um, that is a higher efficiency filters that we have installed at our campuses. And so that's one step that we've done. The next priority is air cleaning. And one of the recommendations is bipolar ionization kits for HVAC units. And so one of the things that we're looking at is we said okay let's get somewhat a rough estimate at this point as I mentioned the funding is not here yet but we are expecting to get uh, a funding amount and I'll have Dr. Gutierrez explain the amount there but one of the things that I'll tell you is that the cost that you see here is for the ionization now this is what we would call a turnkey project meaning that it includes labor it includes equipment it includes everything if we were to do all our campuses and all our facilities, it would be about six million if it was our turnkey. However, in speaking to neighboring districts, we are finding that there's some districts that are buying the equipment and having the company show uh, the maintenance department how to install them, the ionization kits. So there's different options on the table. A decision has not been made, but we are excited that with the opportunity that federal monies um, it, it's promising that they will be here and that we will receive them in the district and once we get that funding we will get further guidance through either webinars or TA will guide us through what are the limitations for the funding and then we'll bring it back and let you know the more specifics but this is something coming down the pipeline it's in our hope it's going to happen fast and that we get this funding I wanted to say that uh, I've had these discussions with Mr. Garcia Mr. Garcia has uh, been talking to me about uh, looking at uh, the HVAC, the ventilation system, and, and to be prepared for and have a plan. And that's what I've, we've been meeting, Dr. Cantu, along with her staff, about uh, coming up with a plan. Because when those monies come, uh, we, we need to be ready so that uh, we can be prepared and, and start implementing uh, our needs immediately so that we can start uh, the process right away without having to delay it. And so because I believe that we are going to get um, in the millions. I don't know how much because the, the federal government is going to pass it on to the state. Then the state is going to make that determination of how much money we're going to get. Hopefully, we get everything that we're entitled from the federal government. As we're getting from the federal government, that the state does not cut it off and give us less, but they give us a full amount that we're entitled to. Because uh, projects like this uh, for our district, our size, the, you know, all the campuses that we have, 54 campuses and departments, uh, it's in the millions of dollars to be able to uh, refurnish, uh, change all the HVAC systems that need to be changed and purify the air and, and make it safer for our students and our staff. So it's uh, it's already a work in progress. And Mr. Garcia, we've been working on it because he's brought it up to my attention because it's out there that we need to do better in our HVAC systems and, and the federal government is going to provide that assistance, assistance uh, in the near future. And so we're already working on putting out a plan so that we can be prepared when the money's come in. Thank you. Ms. Pena. And one thing I want to stress, I really like the priority three, which to me should be priority one, <laughs> no offense. Air cleaning, the bipolar ionization for the HVACs, is, that is crucial when you have students in the classroom because of what the bipolar ionization does in converting and cleaning up that molecule because you'll have kids that are gonna be breathing. Some children will take off their mask, but if we can make that one like a priority, to make sure we get all that in all our HVACs. And that's gonna give the comfort to the parents that they're doing what needs to be done to clean the air as it recirculates back into the classroom. So I think this should be a priority. 
one instead of three, but that's just my personal view mm -hmm. on what this bipolar ionization can do to clean the air in all the classrooms. Dr. Kandu, I have, I have a question, and, and I had a question on that, on the priorities. Is that, are the priorities set, the criteria, are those our priorities? Those were set by this particular HR 604 or? Yes, it's a combination of the eight, this, um, this association and CDC along with CDC. This is the recommended procedures, but it doesn't say you have to do one and two. It doesn't say that. It, it kind of puts them in the priority as a choice for the district or an option. And then um, on the filtration, the one for providing higher efficiency filters where we mentioned completed was just ref to refresh my memory and uh, to share with my other board colleagues, our new board members. Is that something that came in with the CARES? No, this was something that when the pandemic hit, okay. um, Mr. Uh, Lopez and the maintenance department identified that we could improve our filters, our okay. air filters, and I believe I said 12, so let me co make a correction. The, the new filters that we're using are 11 and 13, just for as a correction, which is hospital grade. So that was something that we did internally because we felt that that was a better uh, option for our, and we could afford to do that immediately. So that was done, that was not additional funding that we got from in, uh, from the feds or the state. And how often do we need to change these filters? I mean, I know it says completed there, but do we have another, you know, an expiration date here? Yes, Mr. Lopez is uh, advising it's every 30 days. Okay. And I think that's important for our community because I want them to know that we weren't waiting on funding. We took action uh, as we could, and this was something we could do immediately, so those filters have been upgraded. Thank you, Ms. Lopez Valdez. Yes, I just have a question. With us um, calling parents and uh, um, telling students to come back with a three feet um, with a CDC and following all of that, where does filtration take place in all of the guidance? Um, how are, is that being told to the parents? Are, are they aware? Um, and how, how much does that help um, with uh, the capacity of a classroom, the new capacity with a three feet rule? I'm not sure I understand the question, Ms. Uh, Lopez, but what I can tell you is that these uh, filtration, as far as getting it out to the community, we're working on some videos on talking about the safety so that we can post on our websites. There is one that was completed. Uh, so there's some things on the pipeline um, to show our parents that we've taken extra precautions for safety. So that's one that we can definitely include. As far as how often, um, I'm thinking, uh, Every, the classrooms that have the any filters, it applies to every classroom and every facility. Um, I know that um, I'm saying this because the CDC does recommend that you inform the community when uh, what what exactly is happening with the air quality when they're being brought in. That is a, a that is correct, ma'am. That is a new uh, regulation with CDC coming in, and our hope is that. Uh, as we begin to receive these fundings and we start making these upgrades that we continue to inform our community that we are making upgrades to keep our students safer and our staff. Thank you. Thank you. And the next items are just items that we have discussed before. They're not new items, but I just wanted to just refresh your memory. Uh, one of the things that we talked about was additional parking at the Hanna area. We had, uh, when it w the new gym has 242 spaces. Uh, the last meeting that we had, facilities meeting, it appeared that um, Part A was the one that was favored. There is a cost of $300,000. We, have, we don't have an allocation, as you saw through the presentation from Mr. Robledo. The funding that we had has been spent. So this is just something to keep on your radar as far as when funding com becomes available. These are some projects that, that have, have been discussed here. The other item is the bleachers. I know that we discussed bleachers for our um, early college high schools, and, and I know that conversations started to happen because we were talking about the soccer fields, where we know that uh, most campuses have three fields, the softball, the baseball, and the soccer field. So I know that our community, all our parents want bleachers everywhere. So I just want to remind you that we can go with a smaller capacity for some of these other um, fields, but if we look at about a 650 capacity, it's about 200,000 per bleacher. So just something to keep in mind, and again, just putting it on your radar, because let's suppose that we say we want every field to have 
uh, new bleachers and we're looking at this type of a capacity, then you're looking at 200 ti 200,000 times three times the number of campuses that we have. So just some ballpark figures so that you can have in your mind at this time, there has been no decision as far as moving forward because that funding is not there. Uh, Dr. Cantu, Mr. Garcia has a question. I, I know that we brought up uh, that idea about uh, bleachers at, at the other fields, but something that has been a concern and I've gotten se several uh, emails regarding some facilities that need to be upgraded. Uh, before we move forward with adding new bleachers, let's take care of what we have, make sure that we uh, check them out and make the improvements that need to be made. Uh, one school in particular is a high school on a softball field that apparently there's issues that some of the bleachers are falling apart. Painting needs to be done to the dugouts. So let's take a look at that and I mean, uh, see what improvements we can make before we move on to adding new facilities or new bleachers. Ms. Peña. I'd like to kind of piggyback on that because of the bleachers. As long as you keep them up and you make sure you send them down and you repaint them, those bleachers can last forever. But if we sit there and kind of say, oh, we'll do it tomorrow or no, we're not going to do it, then we're going to have to end up replacing it because the wood will deteriorate because we didn't keep up the maintenance. And I think this is what he's referring to, that we need to keep up the maintenance. And I know I want all the bleachers for all the soccer fields, for all the schools, but there's some out there where you sit down and People get up and they tear their pants. No offense, I've seen it happen. So, and they're walking around with a hole and they don't know that they got it from the school. And it, it's just an accident because wood does that if you don't keep it up. So can we do that at the same time that we maintain that, that really needs help that we're using, and then also make sure we get the bleachers that are needed for the soccer fields? Yes, ma'am. I will have our uh, maintenance department uh, complete a walkthrough of our facility and that way we can see, identify which areas need to be painted and so forth. Yes. I think mo most important, I think, in, you know, and I know that I've received several uh, emails just within the last six weeks, right? And I think that most important for me, and um, I hope that I echo the same sentiment as my other board members, is that, you know, we, we really want equity for all activities for our students, whether they're fine arts, whether they're sports, you know, so I think, uh, you know, for, for all activities. And I think that um, when you mention a walkthrough, I think that it's important the way we do a walkthrough for maintenance, that we do a walkthrough for all the, these facilities in all our campuses, um, including our, our fine arts as well. Ms. Gonzalez? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I'd actually be interested to see, uh, after a walkthrough, a listing of, yes, every single sports, basketball. because I have a list from basketball. Uh, little little things like that maybe what we could do is is just let's do a walkthrough of every single sport uh what uh athletic thing that we have and then activities and then thank you and then go from there uh, and, and uh definitely equity at every single campus I, I i would feel uncomfortable um i know some campuses are bigger than others but i would just feel uncomfortable uh to know that one campus has bigger bleachers than another campus if, if they all go play at different campuses. That, that makes me kind of uncomfortable. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ms. Peña. I guess what we're trying to say is let's fix the little things. Let's fix the little things that need to be fixed right now that can be done and not put them away on the side and worry about getting these huge things when we have little minor things that we can dress up and let the community know that we care about their schools no matter what the sport or what the activity, we're going to give them 100%. Because sometimes it, they get the impression that we lose focus on the little things and we're taking care of the big things. And then in the long run, the big thing doesn't get done and the little thing didn't get repaired. So let's make sure that we keep our eye on both, please. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. The next item, uh, just again to put on your radar, this is one that you've seen has to do with the Veterans Stadium, looking at Veterans as a second stadium. And so there's still some work being done as far as what the cost would be on the removing the logo. So this has, not much has been done on this, but I do want you to know it's on our radar and we are working on that. 
The scoreboard repairs, um, um, we had shared with you that there were some problems with the speaker. We had shared with you. Uh, we did request all the work orders. We also requested um, the work orders from the company. And I will tell you that because of the urgency that we do have graduation around the corner, um, Mr. Uh, Coach Leal has uh, found the monies to take care of the, rep the repairs right now. However, I want you to know that the accountability piece is still there. Uh, Mr. Um, Salinas is working with Mr. Hinojosa on how do we get uh, hold accountable the company. Uh, in the report that we did get from them, there was several work orders that were done. Um, so there is some, there may be some legal action coming up, but as far as right now, the urgency is we have graduation around the corner. We want to make sure that we have those speakers working and the jumbo screen working. So uh, for the immediately, we're going to go ahead and move forward with repairs. Question? Ms. Peña. And what I see here, Dr. Gutierrez, is it's cost 14500 just to come and tell us what's wrong with it. it. That doesn't include the repairs in any way, shape, manner, or form. So um, and it's kind of heartbreaking for the millions we spend on that. So it will cost the district 5000 for that person to travel to Brownsville, 9500 for the assessment, and repair costs are not included at all in the 14500 Am I correct? You're correct. And that's... I mean, this, that's what the best we can do. There's no other way. Miss, I, I would like to add, I, just to see if maybe um, to refresh my memory, I believe that we had a concern last time as well, Mr. Garcia and I. Um, and I think what the response was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that if someone else locally touches that, that we lose a warranty. There is, the speakers had a warranty of two years, if I remember correctly, and that is out of warranty. Now there's other components of the scoreboard that do have a longer warranty. But it has to be the original installer to come. Is it, this price is from the original installer? Yes, it is for VCR now. Yes, it is. And I believe that if we hire a local, um, if, you know, I don't know, mechanic or whatever, to come in and, and uh, assess you know whatever's wrong with it and they touch something or you know they move a wire that we can lose a warranty uh, we're yes what we're doing is making sure that we repair it but yet respect the fact that the company and so we are looking at vcr now that's the original company so that we can continue to look at um, warranty for the rest of the areas yeah because i think we had that discussion to maintain the integrity of the whole system under because there's some systems that are still under warranty can we find out <coughs> and get a detailed report to us on what that warranty is and how long it is and what part of that system that warranty is and if you repair what needs to be done without touching the rest then the warranty continues so can we get that detailed report i think uh, coach Lea, can yeah. you come up yes. coach Lea, to do the you want to elaborate to a little bit because that was I the last concern is the last concern Ms. Peña, the exactly yes. what you're just mentioning because the what was we're going to repair right now is out of warranty the control panels so i want to know what yes, warranty uh, we have and on what and how long Ms. Peña, uh dr gutierrez uh, dr tipton uh yes originally the the original warranties are over two years for the audio five years for the computer components and 10 years for the video board uh we have had numerous discussions with vcr now uh trying to get the uh the history of work orders that we've had with some of the issues with the uh with the audio uh, officially according to in the eyes of vcr now the uh, warranty for the speakers has has expired uh, i know we i know we have graduation in order to be uh to, to be c correct with the uh, with the pricing we did submit a po for uh, to vcr now for nine thousand five hundred dollars that includes the diagnosis and the repair for the for the speakers so it's nine thousand five hundred for the entire PO, uh, PO that was approved uh, they'll be coming down here in the next couple of weeks they'll diagnose the problem now whether our, our district wants to uh, pursue uh, legal action as far as for looking at you know the the history of the work orders with some of the issues that we've had with the scoreboard our bottom line is as far as for us with the district we want to make sure that the, with everything at the board was operational before graduation get here in two months if I may Ms. Peña. Um, so then uh, you said 9,300. So the four, uh, 14,000 here does not apply anymore? Uh, the, the original two requests from, or actually the two estimates from VCR now was 5,000 for just the diagnosis only and ni or 9,500 for the diagnosis and repair for the board. So it's 9,500 for the complete 
uh, repair and diagnosis of the board. And we have to pay $5,000 for them to travel here? That, that's included that's, in that. Oh, that's included in because it says five thousand dollar travel and nine. This two, one two different er estimates. One was just for the diagnosis for five thousand, and the ninety five hundred was for the diagnosis and repair. But well, I'm, I'm sorry, we keep kind of asking and answering the same question. So this is not correct. It won't cost us a fourteen thousand five hundred for them. It's going to be nine thousand. That's correct? correct. That's correct. Okay, so I just want to be clear because it says here five thousand for travel for the assessment. Correct, and then nine thousand five hundred for the repairs. That's correct. So this is incorrect. What's stated here? Uh, actually, that is correct from the original two estimates. It was five thousand for just the, just the initial diagnosis, and the second estimate was for nine thousand dollars. That same company would come down with their eighteen wheeler with all the parts possible that that could could that could be wrong with our system. They'd have it all there in their truck, and they'd be able to go over there and just fill it, fix it on the spot. So it's for, for the 9,500, it's the travel plus the maintenance and the parts to get the, uh, the, the scoreboard operational by the time they leave. I think to clarify, it was the 5,000 only to travel and assess only, That's period. Yes. That's or or 9,500 to travel and fix it at the same time. That's correct. So there's instead of and, it should have been or. That's correct. 5,000 to, to for travel and assess only or the, the 9,500 to travel and fix the problem. And that's what we are recommending, the 9,500 to travel and fix it for $9,500. Okay, yeah, because the way it's written, it's like way, <laughs> and remember, in the United States of America, what's written down is what they go for. So I wanna make sure that we are correct with that. Do we know a timeline of when they're going to be coming down? The, uh, the PO was just approved this week so I've already sent communication with the, with that uh, approved PO. So I'm awaiting for uh, for correspondence with that. I'm I'll, if uh, you know I would think the next couple of weeks. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, thank you, Coach Leon. I'll make a correction on that PowerPoint because I know it is posted. And uh, the last slide, of course, is just thanking the team. Um, there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes from the budget, um, both Mr. Robledo and Ms. Garza, to the facilities teams that you see there, the assistant superintendent for operations, our maintenance team, our project managers, uh, purchasing department was very involved with us, and also our athletic department. So just thanking everyone for the work that goes uh, to put all this uh, presentation together. Uh, Dr. Cantu, just a... Uh, did we have anything to discuss on the middle school tracks? I know we have it on section D at the, la at the second page. Was there anything, any updates on the middle school tracks? And you know what, I did not include that slide, but yes. Um, Just give us an update on that. Yes, the middle school tracks, um, we do have some campuses uh, that um, there's some repairs that are needed. I believe that's what the topic was on the middle schools. And uh, the situation with those is that we are working with the original contractor to see if we can get those them to repair it. Uh, there's some conversation going on. It has not been resolved. And I'm going to ask Mr. Uh, you know, Jose to help us with more of a detailed update on that. Uh, yes. Um, th it's a situation also where the warranty is also passed. And uh, on the actual construction, there's a warranty on the surface, but surface not honored unless the the, uh, the construction is correct. So the contractor understands that. He's, he wants to continue and work with the school district. So he, we've sat down with them and discussed what, uh, what are the remedies, uh, trying to um, uh, find where, what the cause of it was. And I think we've we pretty much pinned that down. Um, he, and we have some ideas. There's, there's gonna be some, some evaluation also on how we're going to go about it but uh, uh, he is talking to us and we should sh we should see something happen shortly if there's any Don't additional information needed on the middle school tracks we'd be happy to elaborate more yes I, i'm just concerned that they you know we've heard you know and Mr. Hinojosa, I don't think you were here at the time, but we've heard these concerns on these middle school tracks and these contractors, so is there anything on the contract that some terms, you know, that they need to, res you know, be more responsive? I mean, it's been, I mean, it's, I think the tracks were finalized, I don't know if somebody can help me, 20, three years ago. Um, and so, you know, we've, you know, we just, 
just if anyone legally we can look at the contract and see if you know there's some terms that they need to respond to us within so many days um, and if not for us to go out and look for some other I don't know vendors and then to try to repair our, our tracks for for our students Mr. Salazar <laughs> yes okay we'll have legal review those contracts Uh, Ms. Peña? Yes, I have a question on 42, page 42. Uh, the uh, estimated total cost turnkey includes, includes labor? Yes, you're talking about this, this slide right here. Let me go back. This one? Yes, that one. Yes, this one was a proposal that we got to get an idea if it would be a turnkey, which means it includes labor, equipment, everything included. There's other options that we can explore that may be a little bit more cost efficient. Now, do we have that comparison in writing so we can compare if it's more cost efficient? Or are you still working on trying to put that together? Um, the conversation that we had with our superintendent was uh, let's explore different options. So we are exploring that as we speak and we're putting some numbers together on that. Thank you. Thank you. And that is all I have. That concludes our presentation. But uh, if there's any questions, I can certainly entertain them. Any questions? Just a, a lot on facilities, and it, it's always work in progress. It never ends. And, you know, I want to thank Dr. Cantu and her department and staff and everyone, because facilities is just uh, every day there's something new, and we're keeping up with everything that is coming up, and along with maintaining our buildings and, and renovating and improving uh, every facility in our district so that we could make it better for our students and our staff. Thank you, and I know that um, our facility chair, Ms. Brown, always likes to name them. <laughs> so we want to thank Dr. Gutierrez, uh, Superintendent, Mr. David Robledo, CFO, Mary Garza, Finance Director, Manuel Hinojosa, Architect, Mr. Jimini Haynes, Assistant Superintendent, uh, Cesar Lopez, Maintenance Administrator, Martin Espinosa, Projects Facilities Manager, Mr. Fernando Villarreal, um, Ms. Rosie Peña, Purchasing Department Director, Mr. Gilbert Leal and Ms. Powers, and thank you everyone for, for all of your, your efforts. Thank you. And public comments, we, the first person that we have is Mr. Sergio, Sergio Zarate, uh, virtual. Subject to be discussed, junior high school facilities. Okay, may I proceed? Uh, yes, yes, and you will have five minutes, Mr. Sarate. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, ma on, please. Yes, Madam Chairwoman, members of the board and staff, my name is Sergio Sarate. I am representing uh, an organization called Down by the Border, uh, for which we advocate for children and adults with special needs, and kind of wanted to touch on some of those things that are that are happening on our campuses. I uh, wanted to make sure that we address the needs of, of those children who have special needs. The 6,000 plus that are there, which is about roughly 10% of your uh, student body. And so we always want to make sure that they are uh, addressed uh, and, uh, uh, in, in ways to facilitate around the school, uh, but also in, in the athletic fields. I think that's more of what this call uh, and what my position is right now. I am on the road coming back from Austin. I pulled over, so safely <laughs> I'm speaking to you. Uh, and I wanted to make you aware of a bill that is coming down. Uh, it is uh, Senate Bill 776 and House Bill 2193. Uh, it addresses UIL to put adapted sports or uh, inclusive sports uh, in our schools. So today there was a meeting with UIL and Special Olympics, and it looks like it, 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 we have come together on it, and we are going to be moving forward on it. So I guess my position is that this is coming. I wish that you guys would start uh, implementing facilities and, and uh, fields that are adaptable to all children. And when I say all children, I do want to point out the child in the wheelchair. We can never leave that child out. Uh, I know that it was a little disappointing uh, as, as I pulled over and I saw uh, some of those playgrounds. 
these companies will tell you they are uh, compliant. However, a wheelchair cannot get on to those playgrounds. And I'm not talking about getting up on a, on a slide or a swing of that nature, but there are playgrounds that have areas where a child in a wheelchair can interact with another child and they can play tic-tac-toe. There are panels that can be put. Uh, and so I, I feel a little bit responsible in that I, I should have addressed this before some of these playgrounds were put, uh, but there are ways to get them up to compliance. When you build a bathroom uh, and they say it's ADA compliant, there is no question that the door will open the right way, the handrails will be on the side, and it is not only for a special needs child with autism or Down syndrome, but it is it, it complies to the child in a wheelchair. And unfortunately, we have, we have uh, sometimes gone with the recommendations of these companies and if you look closely uh i saw some of the i guess it was uh it's not grass but it's some sort of a, a bark that they put for maintenance reasons so grass won't grow out however a child with special needs may not be able to access it uh because of that okay so uh just wanted to uh you know give you a heads up and hopefully that you can start uh planning on how we will address the sports that will be coming down uh, from UIL with a partnership with uh, Special Olympics uh, to be, I believe there's two sports in the fall and two sports in the spring. If this does pass, it will begin September 1st of this year. I don't expect that we would be doing a sport in the fall right away, but it would be a planning and a, and a time to plan. And uh, I hope that uh, we can work together to make that, uh, uh, provide that for all children that want to participate in sports and not just the 18 sports that we offer today. And that is all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Sarate. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Next person is Mr. Patrick Hans, HVAC and ventilation with BEST. Good evening, Chairperson Tip uh, Dr. Tipton, Dr. Gutierrez, members of the board, Patrick Hammes speaking on behalf of uh, BEST AFT, uh, Brownsville Educators Stand Together, Amer American Federation of Teachers. Um, most of my questions were answered by Dr. Contu's presentation uh, or concerns. I do have four four questions that I want to follow up with real quick. I know you cannot answer them. Uh, uh, we're, we're not in a, in a discussion mode here, but maybe I can get an answer uh, uh, in the near future uh, from whoever the uh, chairperson or the superintendent deems appropriate. Uh, the first one is a follow up on, doc, on Daniela Lopez Valdez's question on the, on the current air quality um, it, you know, it sounds like we're, we're you know, with, with the federal stimulus money coming in, that we're going to be able to, to improve the air quality. But what is the current air quality in our schools, and how are we getting that information out to the parents? Okay, is it enough to, to suffice uh, on their concern? Uh, that, that's the first question. Secondly, and I touched on this briefly last month in public audience, um, is we have a lot of campuses that either have windows that don't open, or some that don't have windows. And that's a simple uh, example of a, of a CDC recommendation. recommendation. Uh, what I would ask is the campuses that have windows that for whatever reasons paint, uh, haven't been open for 20, 30 or longer years, uh, is it possible for the custodians to go and, and work on that? So uh, on, on the lovely days that we do have during the school year, that's another option for uh, campuses to have. Um, in listening just to the conversations on, on some of the concerns, uh, the scoreboard and the, and the tracks, uh, my question would be, and I have no idea if this, you know, what, what, the, what the standard practice is, but maybe we should look at getting longer warranties. Okay, if we're having a two year warranty and things are going bad in year three, then we got a problem with, with quality control out there. So I don't know if that's a standard practice on, on, on that. I don't know what the cost would be to the district, but that may be just something you all want to consider. And then finally, uh, the last question would go to the superintendent. Um, you know, I've seen the, the amount of money that Brownsville is, is what, I, what we're supposed to get. 
uh, on the stimulus too. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm just curious, sir. When do you think we'll get an answer from TEA uh, on, on uh, whether they're going to uh, push that money back to us that we that we deserve and that is uh, aimed at us and all the other school districts in in the, in the state, or uh, a percentage of it, or they're just going to use it to supplant? I do know that the money is supposed to be here within two months after Do after President Biden signed it, so that should be mid-May. Um, so I'm uh, curious on when you think we can have an answer, uh, and we will be reaching out to our uh, local representatives and state senator uh, on that issue and also on the issue of equalizing funding. Thank you. Thank you, Thank sir. You. That concludes our public comments. Anything else? Well, thank you, everyone. This meeting is now adjourned.